I'd like to introduce Daniel Hahn, who's the National Program Director for British Centre for Literary Translation, who is the, can I say ringmaster? Yes. I can say ringmaster. Who's the ringmaster of the translation slam? It's my it, fault. It will, it, they will fight clean and swift and fair, and uh, I'll turn you over to him for the rest of the event. Thank you. Thanks, Chris. Uh, good afternoon, everyone, and welcome um, to those of you watching us on CNN, especially. It's lovely <laughs> to have you all here with us. Uh, uh, as Chris said, my name is Daniel Hahn. I'm, I'm very pleased to be here to, to host this event, um, which we keep programming and calling a translation slam, and it's not really. Uh, a translation slam suggests, I think, something which is going to be uh, A, a competition, and B, possibly including a level of violence, which I'm sorry to say we're not going to be uh, delivering today. I'm assuming, but you never know. Um, I will explain to you what it is we're going to be doing. But first of all, I'll just tell you a little bit about why we're, we're, we're going to be talking about translation in this way. Um, as, a, as a translator, like, like these two people, um, I spend quite a lot of time being at public events and talking about translation. And talking about the, the sort of events which some of you will have heard Valerie and the others talking about yesterday. So we talk about um, fidelity and we talk about voice and about register and about cadence and about all of these things which as translators we have to think about. But it feel, feels that sometimes it's quite hard to get a purchase on those subjects when you're discussing them in a way which is entirely abstract. So what we want to do today is to talk about all of those same things but to talk about them um, with an eye on a particular piece of text. So the way we've done that is we've asked uh, Roz and Frank each to produce translations of the same um, 800 or so words of uh, French text. They've done this independently. They've done this without seeing each other's work. Those of you who came in about five minutes ago will have seen them with their first glimpse of each other's work and looking very eagerly and trying to compare, trying to find out what the other person has done. They've only now, for the first time, uh, each has seen what, what the other has done with this, with this piece of text. And what we're going to do is simply go through and uh, look at what they've produced and compare them and see whether, by looking at the differences, of which there are very, very many, see whether we can extrapolate a conversation about things like register, things like voice, uh, and, and to think about translation as something which is not, as I'm sure those of you in the room will know, not something which is mechanical, but which is creative and which is about choices. So what we're going to be doing is looking at a, a piece of French text and then the way in which two, uh, two writers have made choices in order to produce an English text. So this is the plan. Uh, we are going to have a chat for a bit. Uh, I will leave lots of time afterwards for, for questions and for comments because it would be lovely for you to get involved in this discussion. Just to, to give you a very quick uh, tour of the handout, uh, those of you in the room will have the handout on, on your seats. Uh, those of you watching somewhere else will find the handouts down there, bottom of the screen. Um, page one, you will find the French text. Page two, Frank's version of the text begins. And page three, Ross's version of the text begins. If you turn to page five, this is where we're going to be spending most of our time. Um, and you'll find the two texts side by side. And the, this is where we're going to look at sort of the, the contention between the two. We've broken the text up line by line. So you'll see Frank's version on the left-hand side, Ross's version on the right-hand side. Um, that runs, in theory, that runs from page five to page nine. If we actually get to page nine, I'll be astonished. Um, we're going to spend quite a lot of time at the beginning of page five, I suspect. Um, I will very briefly introduce the two people I'm, I'm on stage with, uh, and then we will make a start. To my immediate left is Ros Schwartz. Ros has been translating from French for about 30 years. She's translated. Um, I asked her, and she didn't know. She thinks it's 60-ish books. It's, it's enough that she, she's lost count of them. Um, books by French uh, and French language writers, uh, including... Um, uh, Gosh. Uh, including Aziz Shouaki, Fadou Diomé, uh, Dominique Manotti, with whom she won the uh, International Dagger. Um, and she's recently translate, uh, produced a new translation of Le Petit Prince uh, children's book. Um, she's also, uh, I think it's probably important to mention, that she's also, as well as being a, a very experienced translator, she's also a very significant advocate for the translation world in the UK, having chaired a number of organisations. Um, and she's a, a regular spokesman for, uh, for, for our profession. Um, she's also uh, 
She has the order of, I'm going to get this right, the Chevalier dans l'ordre des arts et des lettres. And before you correct me, it is Chevalier, not Chevalier, and no one, I think, knows why, but this is just how it works in France. So this is Rochefort's. Um, to her left is Frank Wynne, who has been translating from French writers like Michel Houellebecq, uh, Frédéric Baybader, and uh, Amadou Kuruma. He's won the Impact Dublin Prize, he's won the Independent Foreign Fiction Prize, and the Scott Moncrief Award. He's also, in spite of the fact that he's only been translating from Spanish for about 15 minutes, he's already won the Valle Inclan Prize um, for what, his first, your first, second book? Second. Second book. Oh, well, in that case. Um, so he's also a distinguished translator from, from Spanish as well now. So this is, this is who we're dealing with. Um, can I ask one of you, Rosman, can I ask you just to read the first, th say, three paragraphs in French? So just say for, for, the, for those of you uh, here and those of you watching, it doesn't matter if you don't have French. We're not going to spend much time uh, dwelling on the original. Um, but it's just nice to have a sense of, of what it is we're dealing with and what it, what it sounds like. Just the first Your first couple of paragraphs, yeah. please. Lorsque l'enquêteur sortit de la gare, il fut accueilli par une pluie fine mêlée de neige fondue. C'était un homme de petite taille, un peu rond, aux cheveux rares. Tout chez lui était banal, du vêtement à l'expression. Et si quelqu'un si quelqu avait eu à le décrire, dans le cadre d'un roman, par exemple, d'une procédure criminelle ou d'un témoignage judiciaire, il aurait eu sans doute beaucoup de peine à préciser son portrait. C'était en quelque sorte un être de l'évanouissement, sitôt vu, sitôt oublié. Sa personne était aussi incons inconsistante que le brouillard, les songes ou le souffle expiré par une bouche. Et en cela, il était semblable à des milliards d'êtres humains. Bon mot, bon mot, Harry. Go on. La place de la gare était à l'image d'innombrables places de gare, avec son lot d'immeubles impersonnels serrés les uns contre les autres. Sur toute la hauteur de l'un d'eux, un panneau publicitaire affichait la photographie démesurément agrandie d'un vieillard qui fixait celui qui le regardait d'un œil amusé et mélancolique. On ne pouvait lire le slogan qui accompagnait la photographie. Peut-être même d'ailleurs, n'y en avait-il aucun, car le haut du panneau se perdait dans les nuages. Thank you. If you glance at the, uh, the side-by-side -side translations, you will notice very quickly that there is almost nothing in common between the, the two translations that have been produced. There are, uh, there are 42 sentences in this, in this little chapter. 40 of those sentences have differences um, in the versions that Frank and Ross have produced, uh, which does mean that we could be having an, an eight or 10 hour conversation and I'm going to attempt to restrain ourselves. Um, but I do want to start with the very first sentence. Frank, would you give us your, your first sentence, please? As he stepped out of the train station, investigator was greeted by a fine drizzle mingled with sleet. Ross? The investigator came out of the station to be greeted by a fine drizzle mixed with sleet. Apart from little bits of individual words like mixed and mingled, the structures of your sentences are completely different. Can I ask, this is a, a very unfair question to start with because it's a very kind of open-ended question, but what were you looking for? What are you looking for when you're trying to produce an, an English version of a sentence like that? Well, one of the things that I wanted to, um, to say specifically was that uh, one of the things that, uh, that Ros and I have talked about before is that there is a collaborative process to um, most translations in that you will eventually end up working with an editor or with the author, unless the author is dead, uh, which can be useful. Um, but um, in this case, um, I very much had... To I felt I very much had to produce something that was as it would be if it were going straight to press. Therefore, mm. I need to make final mm. decisions about things where frequently I would have thought about it, talked to somebody about it, talked to an editor about it, or talked to the author about it. Um, in this case, um, the, the novel by uh, Philippe Claudel is rather different from his, his um, um, previous novels. And I don't know it terribly well. Um, but it does have a very peculiar... Um, rather detached feel. I mean, the fact that um, everyone is referred to by their profession rather than by name, etc., etc. As a result, I felt that actually the atmosphere was crucial to, to how this was established. So the first thing that I did, which is um, cheating, but I don't regret it, is to take l'enquêteur out of the beginning of the sentence and put him in afterwards. So as he stepped out, the investigator, which actually makes the investigator more prominent to my ear in the sentence than if I leave him 
the beginning. Um, the other thing which, and uh, listening to Rawls read, and it's such a, it's so beautiful in, in, in French, one of the, the first things you come up against is une pluie fine and neige fondue. Both of these are lovely sounds in, in French which mean drizzle and sleet. That's it. <laughs> you could say, you know, as I've said, a fine drizzle to try and make it a little nicer. And you could say melted snow, but I'm afraid melted snow doesn't fall. It just lies on the ground. Um, so actually, the sonority of it almost immediately is completely different. Mm -hmm. well, Ross, when you were doing your sentence, did you contemplate, I mean, the things Frank's talked about, did you think about these? Did you think about swapping around the, the, the half of the sentence, for example? Yes, I think um, the, way, the way I work is I do a first draft where I'm sort of following what the French says. And then I start reading it out loud to myself. And this is a, a very crucial um, part of the process. Um, and that's where I, I, I work very much on rhythm. And I think that there are, there are two key aspects of the translation. One is the meaning, and you've got to make sure the meaning's all there. And the other is the music and the rhythm. And a translator finds a voice. That whole process of translation is finding the voice. And by dint of, of reading it aloud to myself and to other people, that voice starts to emerge. And I think I wanted to go in with something strong. And I wanted to start with the investigator. I didn't want to start with something like when he came out of the station or as he came out of the station. I wanted to go in with a bang. The French uh, is not quite either of them, isn't it? Mm. The French is when the investigator, sort of literal translation would be when the investigator came out of the station. Um, he was greeted by. There, there was no argument for keeping that, because neither, you, you both went slightly, slightly one way or the other. There was no temptation to hang on to the sort of shape of that sentence where the investigator, where that word, this guy who's going to be our main character, isn't exactly the same place in that um, sentence? In my original, in my first draft, he was in the same place, but um, like Roz, a lot of what I do, uh, a lot of what a second draft is, is reading aloud. Um, and um, I like and typically how much changes? Typically uh, how much changes from, from the moment when you've got something on the page, you read it aloud, and then um, how much fiddling happens at that point? Quite a lot of fiddling, actually. I mean... Like Ros, I have a tendency to stick as <coughs> close as the English language will allow me to the French in the original. So there will, the, I already know there will be things that will be rather lumpen or, or slightly leaden. That's not really all that problematic. There will, that's less likely to happen with dialogue because I find that with characters, I need to have a sense, I need to have in my head what they sound like when I'm when I'm translating. Otherwise, when I'm going back through it. Um, it's not going to help. I, uh, I, therefore, I need to have made decisions about what they'll sound like. But no, I mean, I will have had an idea of where I wanted to go, of what the atmosphere I wanted to project was. Um, but yeah, I will find that sometimes um, things simply sound wrong when I read them aloud. And sound wrong, it's a bit like what Miles Davis used to say about jazz. Um, when you play a bum note in jazz, it is only a bum note, depending on what the next note you play is. And the sentences here yeah. hinge on each other. Mm -hmm. um, so a, a decision that I may have taken later in a paragraph or early in a paragraph may, may mean, actually, I don't want to say this here now because it, it, it jars with. So what you're doing is you're, is, is you're reading out big chunks and kind of doing it layer by layer rather yeah. than yeah. crystallizing sentence number one. When it's perfect, you put it to one side yeah. and then move on to sentence no, number two. No, 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 not at all. I mean, in, 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 in long bits. And actually, it's not. I mean, I, I may have declaimed once upon a time, but I don't anymore. I'm just sort of... <laughs> I mean, you might, if you didn't know me well, think I was praying. Um, but I suppose in a sense I am too. Um, I don't know. There must be a muse out there for translation. Um, but no, uh, it's... I think it's absolutely crucial, and it is the one thing that I have told any sort of novice translator that I've ever spoken to, is read as much of it as, uh, as possible aloud, um, simply because you have no sense until you do that. Things can look perfectly okay on a page. Mm. Uh, and it's even, I mean, the, the, the process, and because of the way that you set it here, it, it's actually uh, almost set as though it's a book. And there's this terrible moment, the first time I'd ever did a translation, uh, when it comes back to you and it has been typeset. And 
I mean, it's, it looks like it's meant to be proper. It's, it's, <laughs> it's, it's, it, it looks like it's meant to be a proper book now, and therefore you can't go in and, and dig around. Actually, you can, and I still do. But, um, but there is that, uh, that moment, and there's a terrible thing that um, sentences that might look okay on the page. Uh, and it's not as though all sentences can be declaimed. Not all of them are meant to be um, uh, read aloud. But even so, you get something from doing so that, that, that shows you where they stick, where, where, mm. where, where they don't quite, mm. quite work. And that's based on the voice that, that you've got in your head that has developed over the original reading and the first draft and so on and so forth. To some extent, though, presumably, I mean, I, I do want to... We are going to get to the second sentence, you'll see, any moment. But I do, while we're talking about this, want to ask, I and mean, presumably that does to some extent depend on, on your actual voice. Things will sound differently when you read them aloud and when you read them aloud. And I always wonder whether some of the discrepancies are actually because you have different kinds of voice, you have different kind of rhythms to your own natural voice, you have different Absolutely. accents. Yeah. So to some extent, you're, you're measuring it by something which is completely subjective. Mm. It's not just a matter of there are too many syllables in this word and it somehow unbalances the sentence. Some of it's going to be to do with the fact that you have, you're, us you're using your own voice as a, as a measure for this. But, I mean, in a way, the voice comes from your reading. So as a translator, you're first of all a reader and how you read the text and the voice you choose for the translation is going to reflect your reading. And I think my feeling about that first sentence, if you read the French, it, it sounds quite high register, it sounds quite literary. You think you're going to be reading a very literary work, but actually what goes on. It's a very sinister novel and you need to find a voice in English that is going to work. So I'm always thinking very much about the end effect. I want to create the effect for the reader of my English that the French has created for the reader of French and how you do that is going to be different. I don't think this would work in English if one went for sort of high poetry in that first sentence. Mm. Um, and you know, you make decisions. Uh, I had mingled initially, and I yeah. went for mixed because it is one syllable shorter, yeah, and, yeah. And, and mixed and sleet, so you've got a sort of assonance. I didn't, want to, I didn't particularly want to use mingled, and I couldn't find... I, I wouldn't have thought of mixed particularly. It's sort of a dry ingredients thing for me, but... Um, uh, <laughs> um, but I couldn't find a way out of mingled, and mingled is one of those... There are words that you just come to hate in life, and mingled, <laughs> mingled is just not one of my words. You know, I have at least one editor who will go through everything I ever do, um, and um, if I happen to use the word little, will change every iteration to small, because little, as far as he's concerned, is a little word that is used when you are little. Um, <laughs> and he, he just doesn't like the sound, and then I'll go and put them all back in again. Um, but uh, no, I wouldn't have wanted uh, mingled particularly, and I think mingled actually particularly in this sentence, as you say, what's coming next is, is, is rather sinister. Mm -hmm. But to expand on what Danny was just saying, I think that what you read and how much you read influences. I mean, I think a translator is formed not by reading this text now and translating this text now, but by every book I have ever read in, ever read in any language that I have ever read it, mm -hmm. um, because it is mostly an act of writing. Um, and therefore the number of voices that I have depends on people I've talked to, people I've listened to, uh, films I've seen, but pr principally on, on books that I've read. And as I've said to people before, it's not only that if Ros and I both sat down and, in the interest of full disclosure, translated a book which Danny has translated, <laughs> but we're not going to see until it's published, um, all three versions would be the same. But actually, if you asked me to do it two years ago and asked me to do it mm. now, or ten years ago and now, mm. they would be different. Uh, and they might be different as much in tone as anything else. Mm. Sentence number two. <laughs> <laughs> At some point, they're going to accelerate or, or give up. I don't know which will happen first. Um, Frank, will you read the, the French and also and, and then your version of the second sentence? C'était un homme de petite taille, un peu rond, aux cheveux rares. He was a short man, a little plump, and almost bald. Um, I... Hang on, just a second. Sorry, go ahead. He was a short, slightly rotund man, going a bit thin on top. So we have, we have a different, a slightly different structure. We have plump versus rotund, which in terms of register seem to me very different. And we have um, almost bald versus uh, 
a bit thin on top, which are not just different than register, but I think mean somewhat different things. Can I ask, a, a, again, this is a, quite a general question, but with respect to the sentence. Ros, maybe I'll ask you first. To what extent are you, when we, we have, this is a description, a kind of 10 word description of a person. Now, to what extent are you looking at the French words and rendering the words as words into something in English? Or to what extent is there a place in between where you're reading the French, you're creating a picture in your head, and then you are describing this man with a particular kind of hair and a particular kind of shape, and describing that in English? So is there, my question is, is there a kind of an image of this person somewhere in that process in your head? Yes, I mean, I think one, one description of translation is painting with words. You have to see the picture in your mind. You can't, you don't just translate the words. So... Also, because of the character he is and what happens to him in the book, he's a, a rather pathetic character. Um, so going a bit thin on top is, you know, when you start worrying about your hair falling out. Because cheveux rare means sparse hair. It could mean anything. It could mean he, he didn't have a lot of it. He could have very long hair, but a bit sparse. So I've, I've got a picture in my mind. Equally, I mean, um, I would have read... In any, in any text, I would have read it first for itself before I, I began, so I will have an image of who these people are. But even in something like this, even from a standing start, you can't not... If the French didn't evoke a picture in my mind, then I would really have a problem translating it at all, even with you know, <laughs> both hands in a dictionary. Um, um, so I absolutely had... And again, um, I, I was also going for that sort of pathos. He is rather a sort of... Uh, pathetic man, and I, and I, and Plump is just sort of, you know, um, mm. um, it's what you don't want to be. Um, I would call myself rotund if I thought I was plump. Actually, I am plump. What am I talking about? Um, um, and the almost bald, oh, Schwerhaar is, is, is one of those odd things. Um, I mean, it, it means balding. The degree of baldness is left to the reader's imagination, and I decided there was very little left. It was sort of just a tonsure and a comb over, as opposed to it's thinning on top, and you're thinking, oh, God, quick, you know, conditioner, conditioner. (laughs) So if we were casting directors, we'd have slightly different characters there. Yeah, mine's a little, mine's a tall version of Danny DeVito. (laughs) (laughs) That's a really weird idea now. It's completely ruined that book for me now. <laughs> I now have a tall Danny DeVito in my head. When I, um, just out of uh, curiosity or something, uh, I, I ran this, this same piece of text through uh, Babelfish online translator, um, which renders the sentence as uh, Sir, it obviously didn't know what the word Sir meant in French. Uh, Sir was a man of small size, a little round, with the rare hair. <laughs> Did you contemplate the rare hair at any point? Did this, did this, did this, did this no. one of the options you discarded? No. <laughs> but I'm sure that in, in many an upmarket salon it would be offered to you. Especially precious, precious Absolutely. rare hair. When you have, you, you've, you've got these different uh, choices, the word rotund versus the word plump, the phrase a bit thin on top and the phrase uh, almost bald. To what extent... Um, are you writing these words with a, an awareness of what the, 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 the possibilities are and a sort of deliberate choice? And to what extent are you, uh, d- does the word just kind of come and this is the word you use? I mean, how much do you think, well, I could use plump or I could use rotund and I'm going to make a list of all the possible words and I'm going to weigh them up? How much, you, how much of what you're doing is deliberate? Um, I think when you're translating, if you've just done something really difficult and then you get something fairly straightforward, you can sometimes go into sort of autopilot. But then on the second pass, you will say, hang on a minute, is that the best word? And I very often, when I'm working, I'll write three or four possibilities alongside each other with a sort of note, you know, go back to, and then make a choice, not just because of the meaning, but again, because of the number of syllables, the, the rhythm, alliteration... And, and that final choice, it might change um, from one day to the next. But you, you do try to keep in... I, th- I think one of the things about translating is you have to question all the time. Mm. You have to question yourself. You have to question your assumptions. And sometimes you do something automatically. You then go around the houses and try all the different possibilities and come back to your first decision. But it's an informed decision. You've thought about mm. the other possibilities. I think... Um, I mean, there are... Uh, Particularly, there are 
books. There are certain times in certain books, not always, and not for the entirety of any book, um, when you feel that you have a sense of the voice and that will inform a couple of paragraphs and possibly a couple of pages and you will come to a... And you can kind of take a run at it. And yeah, <laughs> you can take a run at it and then you will come to a sentence which you will agonise over for, you know, you know, three and a half hours and think, oh, God. And now you realise that actually when you come back you will have to revisit all of that. What I tend to do is um, I, um, I footnote all the time. I, mm -hmm. I leave footnotes for myself about all sorts of things, about who these people are, what they're doing, about where this is, and, and but also about... Um, alternative possibilities for this, which may be wildly different from what I have, not simply a change mm. of voice, but actually a, a change of, of word, but actually a recasting of the sentence which I think m might have worked. Or frequently... Depending if possibly on what comes before it and what comes mm. after exactly. it. Exactly. Depending Precisely. on the flow of the whole thing. Exactly. So frequently, I mean, if I have chosen to recast the sentence, what I will have done is, is underneath it I'll have put uh, what I originally came up with on my first draft to make sure that I still have it there in case I, in mm. case I change my mind and I decide that actually... Um, and uh, the, the great problem, uh, um, I was only last night watching a process seldom seen by translators. I was watching an editor, edit a translation. Even better, it was not my translation. <laughs> uh, and several, and uh, several hours into it, um, the editor sighed and said, I don't know why anyone would do translation. I mean, it's just one opportunity after another to fail. <laughs> You're not going to tell us who this was, can no. you? No. Or be afterwards. <laughs> um, let's, let's jump to the beginning of the second paragraph, the very beginning. Uh, Ross, will you read the first sentence of that paragraph? Well, la Place de la, la Gare. Place de la Gare. La place de la gare était à l'image d'innombrable place de gare, avec son lot d'immeubles impersonnels serrés les uns contre les autres. Uh, and your English, please. The station square was just like countless other station squares, hemmed in by impersonal buildings. Frank. The station forecourt was indistinguishable from countless station forecourts, with its share of featureless buildings packed tightly against each other. Ross, do we call it a station square or a station forecourt? Okay. I went round the houses with this. Um, in French, it just says La Place de la Gare, which evokes the image of a French provincial town with its station and a square around it where there'll be cafes and offices and, and, and buildings and things. And it felt like a very French thing. And I, I didn't want to put station square. And I went round and round the houses. And I, up until a fairly late stage, had the station plaza because it had to be an outdoor space, um, a place where there are cafes where as people... As opposed to the concourse, which is... The as opposed concourse. to the concourse, it's not an inside space, it's got to be an outside square dominated by the station on one side of it. Um, and then there was something that bothered me about Plaza, and I thought, no, this sounds like an American shopping mall. It's not, it's not working. And then I thought, okay, do we have this in English? What do we call it? Do we have station squares? Not very often. But I googled station square, and lo and behold up came loads and loads of hits with Milton Keynes' new station square development, etc., etc. So, um, unbeknown to me, in sort of architecture speak, town planning speak, we do say station square. So, I went back to station square, and now it feels right. I, I went with... Um, I didn't want to say station, station square. Um, uh, and plus, like, I mean, again, this is... There are things where you have an image of something from the French Place de la Gare. There are any number of them in towns and, and cities all over France, and you know what they are. Um, and if I had to meet any of you there, I'd say, well, let's meet in that square outside the station. I would not say in the station square, and I would not say on the station forecourt. Um, but the station forecourt is, is somehow still part of the station, isn't it? It the is. Forecourt is, is the taxi rank might be there, and it it's is somehow the, it part is of the that bit structure, that comes out there. It is not necessarily the, um, um, the whole thing. Um, um, I'm not sure. I mean, were I to do it again, I would probably find. Um, see, the only the only other way that I would uh, that I could have imagined doing it, which it was in I think version two, was um, the square outside the station. But the square outside the station doesn't work because the rest of the sentence can't can't do it. 
um, because it has to be repeated. Indistinguishable from countless other stairs outside. Thank well, you. exactly, <laughs> um, which I'm afraid is... Elegant, uh, isn't it? Uh, it is, isn't it? Um, um, so um, I went with forecourt. Um, I'm not sure that I'm entirely happy with it. I think that forecourt actually stops too, uh, too far. I mean, he looks back. Again, I, I specifically chose the word because we, uh, I'm... I later used the word facade. I mean, that we're, we're, my imagination of, of, of the station itself is as a, something substantial. It's not a sort of ramshackle, you know. Mm. Um, and there are, we know that there are several platforms and we know that there are several trains. Um, so I had a, you know, a sort of diminutive Gardelest kind of thing. And therefore, I didn't feel so bad about using a forecourt. Um, but yes, you're right. It actually, it, it stops about three or four metres outside. It doesn't go to the far side of the street where, uh, where the bar is, for example. One thing which happens later in the sentence is the second half of the sentence you'll notice... Well, you'll notice that Ross's translation is extremely short. Um, Ross has done something extremely economical with the second half of the sentence, um, which I think is, on the one hand, very impressive because all of the information... It's a group of buildings which are tightly surrounding the square. Frank has a, a share of featureless buildings. Uh, it's, it's share of featureless buildings packed tightly against each other. Uh, Eleven words. I counted. Same number of words as the French. Mm. Ross has done something which is, I think, very elegant. It's very economical. Um, hemmed in by impersonal buildings. All of the same things, but in a much more contained space. Is there an element of... Uh, are you aware of having lost something in terms of the shape of the sentence by, by, having, by having sort of constrained it? Well, I think, for me, the, as a translator, you're always juggling different priorities. And here, my priority was to paint a picture. It was so that my English reader is going to see the same thing as the French reader. So what I often do is I read the French text, and then I put it away, and I think about the picture, and then I write a sentence in English. If I were writing this, how would I describe it? And that's what came out. And I think... English sometimes has some extraordinary resources that enable you to do things in very few words. And I suppose I'm, my, my own voice is being economical with language when possible. So having written the sentence, I then check back against the French and say, well, are all the elements there? We've got station, station square, buildings tightly packed against each other, so I felt justified in doing that because I felt that the picture that you get, hopefully, is going to be the same as the picture that you get with the French. So part of it has to do with what resources you have as someone who's using English rather than using French. Mm. And you have, you have, there's a facility to do certain things with this language, which will then be as different as the two of you are yeah. writers of English. Well, yeah, in that there's, case... There's absolutely a sense in which, I mean, both uh, things can be done more economically. I actually very much like what, what Ros has done with that. And I think that uh, my clause, though it is um, um, an exact, or as exact as, a, as moderately uh, idiomatic English can be to the French, um, is, is rather lumpen. It is the sort of thing where uh, I would want to go, have gone back into the editor and say, actually, you know, I don't want to say that it, you know, it's got a lot, you know, it's got its share of. It does say this in the French, and it's, in, it's not terribly... Uh, um, you, you sort of glide past it in, in French. In English, it, doesn't, it doesn't becomes... It doesn't mean anything useful in No, avec son lot de, you know, with its fair share of... You know, it just sort of glides past in French. In English, by putting it down, it begins to mean something that isn't essential to the sentence at all. Um, but I, I also think that rather than um, trying to say that the buildings are packed tightly, to say the square is hemmed in by the, building as an, by the buildings mm -hmm. um, does precisely the same thing much more elegant for mm -hmm. Well, thinking about what, just since you're talking about what uh, English can do particularly, I want to jump a few lines down to a sentence beginning, uh, Il ne faisait pas vraiment froid. So it's the second sentence of the third paragraph, um, um, which is, well, you've both done, I think, something quite interesting. Oh, uh, uh, right, limited to the, the octopus. Page, the With octopus. the octopus. Uh, Ross, will you, read the, will you read the French, please? Uh, where is it? Il ne faisait pas vraiment froid, mais l'humidité agissait comme une pieuvre dont les minces tentacules parvenaient à trouver leur chemin dans les plus infimes espaces laissés libres entre la peau et le vêtement. Thank you. And yours, so we're on the, it's the second sentence on page six. 
your, your sentence for us. Um, it was not really cold, but the damp was like an octopus whose thin tentacles managed to worm their way into the tiniest crevices between skin and clothes. Frank? It was not really cold, but the damp was like an octopus whose slim tentacles managed to snake their way into the tiniest spaces between skin and clothing. Now, what's interesting for me there is one of you has to, to, to worm their way and one of you has to snake their way, neither of which, in fact, is in the French. What you've done is you've created... I mean, th there is a, a small discrepancy in the English between the words you've chosen. Mm. One is a worm, one is a snake. But nonetheless, you've both created an image in the English, which is essentially the same image, which is not something which is happening in the French. In the French, these, these tentacles are sort of just making their way in. And both of you found uh, sort of... In a sense, sort of added something. Is it fair to say you added something, or is that, or is this to do with yes, the I kind of things which we do when we use verbs in English? Well, we a we do this when we. Um, I mean, we very rarely. Um, I mean, when people say yes, but you know, English is a Latin language. Well, it may well be, but we don't enter or leave. We don't enter and exit or or ascend and descend. We go in, we go out, we go up, we go down. Um, we like separable verbs and we much prefer Anglo-Saxon for, for standard register. Um, mm. But also, I mean, if fate in the, in the presence of um, Philip Brodel in this case throws you an octopus, <laughs> I'm afraid... <laughs> it would be ungrateful. It would be ungrateful <laughs> not to get the tentacles to snake or to worm. Um, you have to find, You're building with an image that he's already given you. The cold is an octopus. Okay. And it has tentacles. I'm, I'm going to go with it. It's oh, I'll, I'll go with that. Trust him. He knows what he's doing. So the tentacles have to find their way you know, through uh, um, whatever I've left open, um, through, through the sort of space between buttons. So, yeah, I mean, snake is the obvious word to use, or worm, you know. Yeah. I mean, that is precisely, you, you, get, you get very much the sense of, 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 of movement within it. Mm. And, I mean, the French, you know, literally means manage to find their way. I mean, that would just be... Well, that's even worse because it makes it sound as though they're having difficulty and they yeah. need GPS, you know. <laughs> but it's okay in French because it sort of trips off the tongue, as you said earlier. It's a parvenir trouver leur chemin. It doesn't bother no, there's, you. There's this sort of lovely sort of flowingness to it. And you, as, as with my sort of station forecourt, when you, when you actually put it into English, you think there's, there's information there that was redundant in the original, but you didn't, you you didn't really notice. And some of the decisions that you make, uh, and the vo a voice informs it, um, is that um, I'm prepared to sacrifice this because, it, because if I try and preserve it, it will overbalance what I'm trying to do. Mm. Something happens to the, the uh, register towards the end of this one. Uh, crevices, Ross. Yes. <laughs> Tell us about them. Uh, um, it, it's a much, it's a, it's a more precise word. It's, it's doing something slightly different from. I mean, Frank has. Uh, yes, yeah, Frank has spaces. spaces. It's a very neutral. Yeah, I don't know why I didn't think of spaces. Um, tiniest crevices between. I suppose crevices. Would it was sort of, sort of things that are a bit hidden. Um, I mean, I wonder whether this is something which I have a, a, a kind of problem with as a translator all the time. The French word is espace. Mm. And as a result, you don't want to use space because it sounds like it's into the tiniest somehow spaces between, into the tiniest you're not trying hard enough. You yeah. know, it's, it's <laughs> too obviously... Um, it's, uh, another it couldn't uh, possibly mean that. <laughs> into the tiniest but, but not even that. It's, 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 I think the other reason why you don't use enter rather than go in, not only because you don't use enter very much in English, but also because you look at entrée and you put enter, think it's, it's, really? it's, al it's almost... That's a, what they're yeah. paying me? <laughs> 0.112p? Um, well, it's just like correcting the spelling. It's not, you're not doing anything. You're not making it into anything. You know. I can't never actually remember the Never ever say to a Dutch translator, as was, uh, as was said to uh, him by a um, German uh, who had just bought a novel from the Dutch, who said, oh, well, don't worry about it. You don't have to translate it. All you've got to do is proofread it. <laughs> Sorry. No, I, I can't. I can't. I can't actually remember the thought process that ended up with crevices. It seemed like the right word at the time. The other thing, Danny, uh, because I mean, you, you hinted at this earlier, which is that registers are different for Time for us. Spaces. We have words that, Time in our own heads, we like and dislike and think of mm. as as mm. this or that register. Um, 
and therefore there there are things. Where In the same way, the writers do. The, the yeah, the writers. You, mm. there, there's a kind of little literary DNA you can find in writers that they, they have certain words and they just keep cropping up. Oh, not not even consciously, but because they sort of like the flavour of them somehow. Yeah, yeah precisely. Um, precisely. Now, somebody in a review yesterday of, I think, possibly the Rachel Cusk, um, um, said, um, remarked, um, having clearly not liked the book, that it used the word tenebrous twice. <laughs> what, in the whole <laughs> book? <laughs> I mean, it's not that bad, you know. <laughs> I did once, uh, a writer, I translated uh, four books by the same writer, and I mentioned in passing this one word that isn't it interesting that he keeps using this one word, and he hadn't noticed. And now, every once in a while I get these emails from him saying, I was writing the sentence and then I used that word, and now I feel really self-conscious. <laughs> because he was very happily throwing this word around as though it were the most common word in the world, and it's actually about as common as that. <laughs> yes. The next sentence is... Um, Relatively straightforward in terms of its meaning, but almost nothing is the same in your two, in your two versions. Frank, will you read for a quarter of an hour? Um, for a will quarter you read the mm. beginning for a quarter mm. of an hour? Indeed. <laughs> <laughs> Everyone for make quarter. yourself comfortable. Frank is going to read for a quarter of an hour. For a quarter of an hour, the investigator stood motionless, ramrod straight. His suitcase set next to him as raindrops and snowflakes went on dying on his head and his Macintosh. Nice. The investigator stood rooted to the spot for some 15 minutes, erect, his suitcase at his feet, while the droplets of rain and flakes of snow dissolved steadily on the top of his head and his raincoat. There's almost nothing the same <laughs> in those two sentences. No, it's, it's, it's describing the same thing. It's describing the same action or, or mm -hmm. inaction, a person doing a thing in a place. But there is almost nothing about the vocabulary you use, about the, the register, about even the shape of the sentence. All of the bits of information are in different places. Did you... Just looking at this sentence as an example, did you, how close, this is a very badly phrased question, but how close is this to whatever you drafted first? And to what extent did you move this one around and move beginning to the end and change words? And Yeah, I didn't like this sentence. Um, I didn't like this sentence in, in the original. I didn't like it in my first draft, and I'm not really gone on it now. Neither version of it particularly. I originally did have, um, not droplets, but drops of snow, uh, sorry, drops of rain and flakes of snow. But that was all a bit kind of, there was mm. so much going on. Um, um, so I went back to raindrops and snowflakes. And even that seems just a little on the, you know, twee side for, um, for, for my liking. Whiskers on um, kitties, bright pop, copper kettles and warm woolen mittens. Um, yes, <laughs> yes, it, it, is, it is sort of that. Um, and um, I mean, there is, um, we, we get into this a, a couple of um, sentences down again with, with his description of weather as it, as it interacts with people. Um, I shifted, I think there's probably not a single word or the construct, construction of the sense it, sentence is probably not remotely similar to my original first draft of it, but um, I mean, you're saying um, um, things that one favours. It's not as though I have used um, um, the word ramrod in most of my translations, but when I'm given an opportunity, you know to, but, but when I'm given an opportunity <laughs> to use words. it, I will happily use it. Right. It creates, I mean, right. very much for me, it was a, a way of defining how I saw him and, uh, as mm. a person, and the French offered it to me without specifically giving mm. it to me, so I was very happy to be able to use that. And would you yourself wear a Macintosh rather than a raincoat? Is that just no, the word that not, you have? No, I would not wear a Macintosh. Uh, I have never owned a Macintosh. Uh, <laughs> but if, if pressed, <laughs> between wearing a Macintosh and wearing a raincoat, if we, if we gave you one of these objects, would, would the I would wear would... I would wear a raincoat, but, okay. he would, but, I, but I didn't think that he would. Um, so what's the difference? Um, that's such a mean question. Um, <laughs> ma okay, Macintosh, as far as I'm concerned, is, is, is what, if I were going to wear it, I would call it a gabardine. <laughs> <laughs> because I would be allowed to wear it if it was called it's a gabardine. It's going to be a long day, isn't it? Um, <laughs> um, it's, it comes down to just below um, one's knee. It is generally in a light colour, and it is, used to be favoured by perverts. <laughs> um, they've kind of gone off it, um, sadly. Um, well, I mean, in the days of the internet, you don't need to be wearing one, do you, if you're a pervert? Um, um, but uh, it's very much that. So for those of you watching out there. Whereas, <laughs> whereas, <laughs> whereas a raincoat, as far as I'm concerned, can be kind of any length. Mm. Um, it ha a raincoat has no great defining characteristics for me as a word, mm. um, whereas a Macintosh does. Ross, please tell me you didn't go through all of this <laughs> process in your head um, as well. It's a raincoat, it's an unfamiliar. I wouldn't use Macintosh because 
he's a Frenchman. Mm. Yeah, I did, I did <laughs> think that. No <laughs> so I prefer not to use words that have sort of make you think of an English pervert. <laughs> <laughs> Um, as, as a general rule, for all you, you budding <laughs> translators there, as a rule, avoid the words that make you think of an English pervert. Um, so that, that's, I mean, uh, that's why I wouldn't have used Macintosh. Um, I put the, um, him standing rooted to the spot first and then the amount of time afterwards because I wanted to establish that image of him yep. standing still. Um, and whether it was 15 minutes or 20 minutes, you know, it was a... That comes, that comes secondary, so I, I put that there. Uh, Actually, the one thing that I would have done, I mean, and should have done on, on third pass was just take out the word motionless, because actually I can happily have said the investigator stood comma, ramrod straight, comma, and motionless is already there. Mm. I didn't need to say it again. Again, there are words that, that, by virtue of how you've chosen to translate, end up being redundant, and it's important to rather take them out, because otherwise you, you are just duplicating the sentence. But you notice that they're redundant because you read them aloud and you, you, yeah, there's, the, there's something in the, in the, in the rhythm which emphasises yeah. a word that doesn't need to be there. The thing that I kept, um, and it was a very conscious choice and it wasn't in my first draft or my second draft and I resisted it, was keeping dying for mourir hmm. uh, rather, than, um, uh, hmm. rather than dissolving or, or, or whatever. And I really struggled against it. I find it, I find it reads awkwardly in English, but... It's the sort of thing that actually, without going back, um, without a actually talking to, to the author, I would be loath to give up because there is a sinister overtone mm. to the whole thing and I, I was happy to keep it. But we both um, did not use the primary sense of the word can, meaning skull. Uh, I mean, if it had been dying on his skull, I mean, let's say <laughs> We might well, as well just stop reading there. <laughs> Babelfish. Funny you should mention that. <laughs> you are in very good company because Big people just used die as well. Yeah. Um, during a quarter de hour, the investigator remained motionless, well right, well right, <laughs> his bag posed behind him while the drops of rain and snowflakes continued to die on its cranium and <laughs> it's impermeable. And it's impermeable. <laughs> oh, well, I didn't think of that. <laughs> So tr literary translators will be out of a job any day now. You can see it's so close. It's so Absolutely. close to being literature, isn't it? <laughs> nearly, nearly there. Um, I want to, we've actually almost had an hour, believe it or not. Um, I want to jump right to the end. Um, let's go right to the penultimate paragraph of the whole chapter. Um, the penultimate sentence as well, uh, which is a long and uh, sort of messy sentence, I think, in French. Um, it's page nine uh, in the handouts, and it's the that it begins, and indeed. Um, Frank, would you read the, the French as well, please? Um, uh, yep. Okay, Et d'ailleurs, il avait prononcé sa phrase sans même s'adresser à lui, comme si sa pensée s'était échappée à son cerveau pour volter un peu autour de son crâne, à la façon d'un pauvre insecte résigne parce qu'il s'est condamné à dis disparaître à très court terme, mais qui tient, malgré tout, à assurer le spectacle, à jouer jusqu'au bout sa partition d'insecte, même, si même si cela n'intéresse personne et ne le sauvera de rien. Um, and your English, please. And indeed, the words he had spoken were not even addressed to him, as though a thought had slipped out of his brain to, split a, to flit about his head like a lowly insect, resigned because it knows it is doomed to die in a very short time, but determined nonetheless to carry on with the show, to play to the end its insect role, even if it interests no one and will save it from nothing. Uh, yes. And he had spoken without even addressing him, as if his thought had flown out of his mind to flit briefly around his head like a poor resigned moth that knows that it will die very soon, but is determined to go on with the show and play its role as moth to the end, even if no one cares and it won't make any difference. But all of the things that are different between these two versions, I want to know about this moth. How did this insect become a moth in English? 
Okay, when I read the French, the picture I immediately had was a moth, because what insects flit around? Flying ones, moths. The French word for moth is a very long word. It's a papillon de nuit, literally a night butterfly, which would have been too much of a mouthful. And this is something I've come across before in a number of French writers, where they use a sort of generic insect, where we would use something much more specific if it's a creepy crawly or a bug or, or something that flies. So I saw a moth and I read this to my daughter and um, I've read a lot, of, I've done a lot of joint translations with my daughter. She's now 21 but we've been working together on children's books and she's a very, very good sounding board and I read it to her with insect. I translated it initially as insect and I said to her, what did you see? when I read that paragraph, and she said, a moth. So I thought it has to be a moth because it, it flits. And when I think of an insect, I think of something that's more creepy crawly. Yeah. So that's how I got moth. And it was, it's taking a liberty, but um, I think that if the French word for moth was shorter, that's what the author would have used. Oh, I, I absolutely agree with you. And I also saw a moth. I mean, I, 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 didn't, I didn't use the word moth. It was, it was more than I was prepared to do. And again... In other circumstances, but, it, but, it was, the, but the picture was the same. Oh, the what what was you were exactly seeing was a, the, the was a moth, exactly but you decided to keep the And word. in fact, originally on my second draft, um, I mean, I've gone back to slipped out here, um, but actually on my second draft, before I revised it again, I, I had flown out um, um, because I thought that absolutely the image was utterly clear in the French, even if the specific choice of verbs, and I entirely agree. Um, um, in, in French, um, it is very common to say insect when actually you quite clearly mean a beetle moth on the or a moth, hand, or yeah. frequently something that isn't an insect, like a spider. Um, <laughs> um, but they, they, they will use a generic in a way that we, we won't. And you're right, I mean, no self respecting uh, French writer would have said, comme un papillon de nuit, mm. because it's just one of those um, awkward constructions. Can I go on slightly on that bit? Did uh, Ross, did you think uh, um, where we have the um, uh, assure le spectacle? Um, I did actually in the first draft say, um, uh, but was determined that the show would go on. Because there's no way of not seeing that phrase and thinking the show must go on. Mm. It just isn't. <laughs> um, and uh, in the end, I, I, I didn't. You had Ethel Merman's voice in your head. I really happy. Happy. Well, I so often do when I'm uh, reading it mm. out to myself. Um, <laughs> Um, but I, I mean, obviously changed that. The, the we deliberately resisted that. I deliberately, well, I, I resisted on, on second. And then the ending of, of the sentence, I've done something which, again, I revised twice, but in the end, I, I needed, um, I needed for myself to be able to repeat uh, no one and nothing as, mm. as the sort of ends of, of those sort of sub-clauses. Um, Whereas actually, I think that actually what, what Ros has done um, reads very, very neatly. And it, I had something like that. Um, um, because I find the construction, even if it interests no one, is rather an awkward construction in, in English. Um, I'm going to uh, encourage you to make comments and ask questions in just a moment. I'm going to just ask one last one of my own uh, before that, which is, to what extent was the fact that you were translating this as an excerpt and the fact that you were translating this knowing that you were going to need to defend your choices. To what extent did that change the way you actually did the work? How was it, how was it different? Or was it, was it exactly the same thing? Ross? Um. <laughs> Frank? <laughs> yes, yes, absolutely. Anyone? Um, anyway, um, yes, absolutely. Um, I... Um, the fact that it's being done as an exercise, and the fact that you need, that you will be defending it, um, I do find to some extent inhibits some of the decisions that I might otherwise make. Um, that you might make, assuming that no one was going to. Assuming that my eventual <laughs> readers um, uh, are indeed critics, will be the sort of people who forget to put that it was actually translated from any language, and whose only comment on the translation will either be limpid or inelegant um, um, without knowing what the original prose was like. Yeah. It's very different um, when you 
uh, when you're doing it as an exercise. Um, and I very much tried, because I've, I've done this with you before, Danny, and I very much tried in this case not to do that. Um, and therefore, I, particularly on, on, on second and third drafts, was um, made choices so that this would not actually be, as it were, what I might offer an author or, or, or an editor, but something that I would be happy to actually go to print with. Mm -hmm. Um, was your question about it being an excerpt? Well, it's, it's both. It's, yeah. it's, it's, yeah. The two things that make this process unusual, one is that you have to defend it, but also you're, def you're translating something which is uh, taken out of context. And there are certain things, I mean, there, there's, for example, there's one decision which you, which you both made, which is perfect for the excerpt, but which, in fact, if you translated the whole book, you couldn't have done, yeah. because of the word garçon, uh, which you translate as waiter, which would be fine, except later in the book, you need something else to be the word for waiter, and they have to be distinct. Right. So, so that one part of the question is, you're looking at this um, as though it were a, a, a single text, but in fact, there's only 800 words of a big book. Mm. But the other is the extent to which, when you're translating something, knowing that someone might put you on a stage and say, why did you use the word little rather than the word small? Okay. You're slightly more right. aware that, the, yeah. the, that, you, that there is a kind of scrutiny which is going to have to be put under. Okay, I'll answer the first part first. Um, I don't like translating something as an excerpt, because especially when it's the first page of the first two pages of a novel. Had you read the book? Yes. I mean, I read the book once I'd started doing the translation, because the, the first pages of any book are so important. They set the tone, there are clues, uh, they, they build up an atmosphere. So I didn't feel comfortable just translating two pages. So what I did was I drafted the translation. We, we had four weeks to do this, um, which was very nice because it meant we could sort of do consecutive drafts and put it aside and think about it. So I did a draft. Then I read the book, which gave me a lot more confidence for some of the decisions that I made and made me aware of some of the things that were going on in these first two pages that need, needed to be brought out. To do with things like tone, you mean? Yes, and you know it's 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 a very very sinister book, and that's something that you're aware of, and so you're looking at, okay, if there are choices, is there a word that's a little bit more sinister that helps to to build that atmosphere? So, um, in a way, I I didn't do it as an excerpt; I did it as the beginning of a book mm. that I'd read, um, and then in in terms of knowing that we were going to be put on the spot. Um, I just translated it as I would translate anything, as, as, as Frank says, as if it was going to press. As you, it's taking responsibility for what you do. Mm. And I think what has to be said is that, you know, no translation is perfect. A translation can always be improved. And, you know, you, you give it your best. And there are all sorts of criticisms that can be made. A lot of it is just subjective mm. preferences. But that I think you is also important. It's not just a matter of things being able to be improved. It's a matter of them being different because they're different. They're different. Because oh, you have different voices, because you have, have different, different words voices. you like, because you read and you privilege different things. Yeah. Um, so I feel I, I'm prepared to defend pretty much most of what I've done. There are things that I would probably do differently if I were to sit down and go over it again today. I mean, um, I didn't... Uh, um, I mean, I'm, I'm familiar with what the book is, and I had... Um, if I'd had the time, I'd like to have actually sat down and read the whole thing. I skimmed the first three or four chapters um, um, to get a better sense of what the context was, but no more than that. Mm. Um, and, uh, I mean, because we had the time we had, I was able to do a draft and leave it for uh, a while while I was working on something that was utterly different. Um, and in that sense, yes, the fact that it's an excerpt makes a huge difference. I mean, not only because, as you say, there, uh, there will be a point um, where I wouldn't have been, I would realise that I wouldn't have been able to use um, waiter for garçon, but also because, as at the end of a first reading, but also at the end of a first draft of, of anything that, has, that is complete in, in and of itself, you have a sense of the shape of it mm. uh, and of what things about it, in terms of tone or register, but also about individual characters and so forth, um, mm. are being foreshadowed or are being, uh, particularly as you say, opening. Um, it's a foolish writer who doesn't actually, you know, use the opening um, um, paragraphs and, uh, and, and pages of, uh, of a novel like that. And so, yeah, if I if I'd done the whole thing, I might well have done it rather differently. Thank you. We have uh, six or seven minutes for uh, a question from John. There we are. That was easy.
That's a really important question because in a way you're talking about the ethics of translation and there's a huge danger of, of colonising a text in a way by making it sound as though it's so English that it couldn't possibly be about anywhere else. And I think that sometimes as translators we, 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 we want to over-translate and over-explain things. And if you think about books that are written in English by non-English writers, writers from India, Australia, South Africa, America, they use words and cultural notions that are completely foreign to us. I mean, I remember as a kid reading American books where people were always eating Hershey bars. I had no idea what a Hershey bar is, um, but you knew from the context what it was. Um, so I think that it's really important to leave certain things in, um, especially, you know, if they're food, you keep them in the original, but you can always work in a sort of explanation ex so that people get a sense of it's a kind of beef stew or whatever. But I, th I think as a translator, you have to be very, very aware of those, that danger. And, and it's, it's a battle we sometimes have with editors who want to flatten things and standardize things. And it's even, I, I translate quite a lot of North African writers who use a lot of <coughs> Arabic words in the French. And those words would be much more familiar to a French readership because of their relationship with North Africa. So I sometimes create a glossary at the back. I'll keep the words, but put a glossary for the English reader. So there are all sorts of ways around that, and I think it's very, very important to, to preserve them. I completely agree, <coughs> and um, I also agree that actually editors don't always um, go, uh, go with it. Um, the idea of changing... Um, foreign street names, just seems to be utterly ludicrous. But French translations of English or Spanish books always do. And I don't mean they just say La Rue Oxford for Oxford Street, but I mean if it was called, um, uh, if it actually had a, 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 a meaning in itself, they will translate the, the meaning of the, of, of the word, <laughs> which is just a nonsense, you know. I mean, um, it doesn't, you know, if, I, if I'm on the Champs-Élysées, I am not on the Elysian field. <laughs> Nobody, hopefully, is, is going to think that I am. Um, so th there are those, and most people will accept it in French. And then they'll be a bit picky when they come to, you know, because um, I, I very recently started doing Spanish as well, and they say, well, are people going to know what it is? They know it's a place in a town in a place. You know, I mean, how much do they, do they need to know? I mean, um, anybody who hasn't been to Nevsky Prospect doesn't know what it is, but you can vaguely assume that it's, you know, it's a street of... It, it may be boulevard in size or avenue size or street size or, or whatever. And what I do precisely, as, as Ross was just saying, that you gloss. So a uh, Cajon is going... You may have to say narrow or, or whatever to convey the fact that this is an alley, whereas obviously in the original you don't need to do that. But the secondary thing, which is both within dialogue and within slang, and again with North African writers... Um, uh, or others where there is embedded Arabic or, or, or something else, um, which I have always uh, preserved. And depending on the novel, I, I, I dislike footnoting or, 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 mm. or whatever. If I can gloss in the text, then I will gloss in the text, and I will always tell the author that I'm glossing. But I've also done, I've gone slightly further than that in that uh, um, a novel I did of, of an Algerian writer, and one of the novels that I did by by Kuruma, which is set in, in um, Ivory Coast and Sierra Leone. Um, there are words that I back-translated from French into Arabic on the one hand and, and Malinke on the other. I, mean, I didn't, they did. Um, because it would have sounded odd. I had a, an, a French Arabic ca character who clearly is talking to his, um, uh, to his aunt, um, who he has known from back in the bled, uh, and they are now living in Paris. When he uses the vocative, I cannot have him call her auntie. <laughs> yeah, I just can't, you know. Um, um, but I didn't think that calling her tata was going to be all that much better. Um, so I asked William what he would have called his aunt, and we used that. Uh, mm. And ditto, I did some with Malinke, with, with, with Kuruma, on words that would otherwise... If I... They were fine in French because actually both of these books were written in, um, in French by French-speaking West Africans or North Africans. But if you'd ended up translating them, um, you, ended up with, uh, you ended up with something cumbersome. Now, things that have an emotional 
resonance, certain things within slang to give you a sense of place, uh, to, to preserve a, a sense of place at, at certain times are crucial and worth fighting editors for because otherwise, I mean, I did a, a book that I was uh, talking about um, last week um, where I preserved quite a lot of, um, you know, a sprinkling of, of, of slang from, uh, from the poorer districts in, in, in Buenos Aires because um, otherwise it, you end up in danger of writing an episode of The Wire or writing an mm. episode of Skins or, right, you know, not everybody speaks the same. And as long as you give your reader enough uh, for, for them to be able to use that and flow with it, and as long as you, you blend it in, it actually adds rather than detracts from what you're doing, I think. It's unusual that this particular text is unusual also because it's obviously a French book, it's obviously written in French and the voice is, and it's inspired by an actual thing that happened in France. But there are no markers in the text at all. You have no way of knowing where it's set. Um, let's have one more quick question. Uh, yes. This is the, the, the guy has asked for a drink and the waiter said, I can't give you one of these. And then in the French it just says, uh, he almost failli faire une remarque. He almost commented and Rod has, I almost said, nearly said something rude. Yes. Is that, is that an interpretation? Then? Well, I don't think he was going to say something complimentary. Um, <laughs> How nice of you <laughs> to be able to serve me. <laughs> um, I think faire une remarque has slightly negative, I mean, it's making a rude comment, it's not, um, it's usually critical, you know, French will say, can I, permettez-moi de faire une remarque, it's, can I say something, and it's, it's usually co sort of critical. Um, I think, again, I think there is, uh, there's a point when you're translating something where the text starts to inhabit you, and you feel quite authoritative. And you, you, you feel, if, if the writer were writing this in English, I think this is how he might have said it. I think our, our investigator's pretty fed up. I mean, it's ridiculous. You know, I, can't get, I, can, I can make it, but I can't give it to you because the cash register can't do it. So my feeling was, he was, he was, the reason he stopped himself was because he didn't want to say something rude and antagonise the guy. So, yes, I'm, I'm interpreting. Um, and maybe I'm out of line. But I think that's what's meant. He's making a rude comment. And then yeah. ordering a sparkling water or a mineral water, depending on who you ask. But we're not going to go there. Because <laughs> we're out of time. Um, it's a question down there. Uh, time for one more? Do we have time for one more quick question? Uh, yes, OK, very quickly. Um, just a really quick question. With children's fiction, do you have difficulty um, with words that, you know, let's say for six, six-year-olds, the cat sat on the hat. With seven languages, seven languages, Yes, I mean, again, I think with, with children's books, you're, you're playing with music and rhythm, and you have to sometimes do some quite creative things, as Danny will tell, tell us about the book you've just done, where you end up doing something that's going to work in that language. Because sometimes the most important piece of information is not that it's a particular animal doing a particular thing. Maybe if you wanted to say the cat sat on the mat, if you translated that into French, it wouldn't have monosyllables, it wouldn't rhyme. On the other hand, in French, if it was un souris, who was assis sur le tapis, for example, you, <laughs> get, you get the sound by... Yeah. But it, it, if, if the important thing is that it is a cat, that it is this particular species, then you have to privilege the, 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 the meaning of that thing. if it's illustrated. If it's illustrated, then you're just in <laughs> trouble. Yeah. Um, yes, you, you are kind of screwed if it's illustrated. But you, um, you use the resources of the language that you're working in. I think it's not only true. I mean, it is very much true of children's, of children's fiction. Um, but I think it is true of all fiction, and, and Ross said more than once today, that actually um, a lot of what 
she tries to do and what I certainly try to do um, is to recreate the impact of the original. If the impact of the original is mostly in um, its sound, its rhythm, it, whether or not it rhymes, whether or not it's funny, uh, rather than, than the data which is mm. then, mm. then mm. it's crucial that you follow that. Because the Nabokovian Dr. Seuss, with footnotes everywhere that has literally <laughs> just given you every word, is of no use to anyone. Uh, well, not to, a, not to a casual reader. Not Perfect to a six-year-old. Six <laughs> six well, I suspect that Dimitri was probably, by the time he was six, going, my oh, father, no footnotes here. Um, 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 but, no, I, I think that that's absolutely crucial. Um, and I don't think that that is to betray the literalness of the original. And of course, in something like The Cat's Fat on the Map, or Spot, who is presumably not even called Spot in half a dozen languages because Spot would not be a good name for him. Um, I think that that is what you do. You may, and it can vary from sentence to sentence, that actually what you're privileging in this or that sentence is different, mm. depending on what you think is absolutely crucial um, to be there. I mean, there are times when not only have you got to make a joke funny or a pun that doesn't exist uh, or whatever, but actually that still needs to dovetail with something that's going to happen 20 pages from now, mm. um, where another cat is going to sit on another mat. I'm afraid we are out of time. Um, we were asking Frank and Ros to do something which I think is very difficult to explain, sometimes word by word, and also something very uh, potentially very exposing. So I think it was very brave of them. So please uh, join me.